Well, good morning, guys. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Dr. Cliff Olson. I've uh, introduced myself to each of you when you came in. We might have a few more coming in uh, throughout this, so um, that's okay. I'll go ahead and get started with you guys. Um, the reason that I wanted to do this talk for this community is because there is a lot of misinformation that's out there about hearing loss and about hearing loss treatment options and things of that nature. So uh, before I go into that, I want to kind of give you a little bit of context about kind of what my background is and how I really got into this. In 2002, I went into the Marine Corps and they found that I had a hearing loss related to uh, noise exposure. And so this hearing loss in my right ear almost got me kicked out of the Marines. And uh, fortunately, it was something that, you know, we were just going into, you know, combat time after 9-11. And so it was something that almost just kind of got swept under the rug during that time. So I was fortunate enough to be able to stay in the military throughout my time of having hearing loss. Um, but I spent a lot of time with the military audiologist when I was in. And so this was always something that was in the back of my head, which is this epidemic that we're seeing of hearing loss you know, from a variety of different sources. So um, as I got out of the military, I didn't know at that time I wanted to do audiology, but it was something that was always there. And when I started getting done with my undergraduate degree, uh, I really wanted to commit to something that I knew was something personal to me. And for me, that was audiology and hearing loss. So I ended up getting into the University of Illinois, going through my program there. Everything went fine. But what I was starting to realize is that the impression that we get about you know hearing loss itself and treatment options and things of that nature uh, we don't really uh, have good access to accurate information a lot of things in the the hearing industry is driven by like hearing aid sales surgeries things like that and so I wanted to clear up a couple of these uh, myths that I call them about hearing loss in the hearing industry okay this is actually a picture of me when I was in scout sniper school in the Marines. I had a hearing loss at this time. Fortunately for me, because I had that experience early on in my career, I was able to start protecting my hearing from an earlier point than a lot of these guys that I served with. So um, after you know having years and years of us being in uh, wartime, essentially, there's a lot of individuals with noise-induced hearing loss coming back from overseas, and this is the one type of hearing loss that is actually preventable. Um, so it's important that we understand uh, protecting your hearing loss is just as important as treating your hearing loss. So myth number one, if you can hear, you don't have a hearing loss. This isn't true, and the reason is, is because Hearing loss encompasses a variety of different frequencies. And so if you broke it down really simply into low frequencies, mid frequencies, and high frequencies, the low frequencies would be what give you that uh, perception of volume. So when someone's talking, you're like, yeah, I can hear them. But if you have a decline in the middle and high frequencies, which is most common, by the way, you actually lose the clarity behind what they're saying. So this gives you that perception again of if someone's talking and you feel like, well, I can hear them, it's just they're mumbling or they're, they're talking too softly, they need to speak up and enunciate better. It isn't that you don't have hearing loss, it's that you have a hearing loss in a very specific area of your ear, okay? So myth number two, only one time in loud noise won't cause hearing loss. It literally takes one time of noise exposure to give you a permanent long-lasting hearing loss. Now, will it happen every single time? No, it won't. It has a lot to do with genetic factors, uh, how susceptible you are as an individual from a noise exposure hearing loss standpoint. But I, there's a story that I wanna share with you, and this is not my military story, but it's a 19-year-old kid who came in, is actually a few weeks ago now, came in with his mother, um, he had gone through MEPS, which is basically the pre-screenings that you have to get into the military, and he failed his hearing test. And so he had gone from specialist to specialist, trying to figure out, okay, is there something we can do for this? And he wasn't really getting answers. Eventually he found himself in front of me, uh, and with my background and understanding of understanding how the military works from that standpoint, um, I was the one to have to tell him that he couldn't go into the military because of this hearing loss. It is an incorrectable hearing loss from that standpoint. And when we did some more digging around, I found out that it was from one time of him going with his family out to the desert to shoot some rifles to prepare him for army boot camp. And 
uh, that one time of going out, he, he experienced that tinnitus or ringing in his ears, and that is what caused his hearing loss to the point where now he can't pursue his desires of going into the military. So uh, it doesn't have to be one, you know, like a gunshot or a firecracker. It can be sustained long-term noise like mowing the lawn or going to a rock concert, things like that. So it's important that we protect our hearing in all of these situations, even the ones that you might not particularly perceive as being extremely loud. All right, so myth number three, hearing loss only affects communication. Uh, while hearing loss does affect communication negatively, not just for you, but for everyone that you know and, and interact with, it has more of an effect uh, on our brain than what we originally thought. So uh, a researcher by the name of Dr. Lin has been really leading this research into cognitive decline or dementia and its link with hearing loss. And so I'm gonna tell you right now, there is no causal effect that we know of right now. There is a correlation effect, however, of dementia, uh, your higher risk of cognitive decline in dementia if you do have untreated hearing loss. And if you have a mild untreated hearing loss, you're two times more likely to experience dementia. If you have a moderate hearing loss, you are three times more likely. And if you have a severe hearing loss, you are five times more likely to experience dementia. Does this mean, again, that if you treat your hearing loss, that you will not get dementia? It does not mean that. However, it is the best recommendation that we currently have at this time, and it's because we don't hear with our ears. We hear with our brain. As long as our brain can get access to that sound, our brain continues to function from a hearing standpoint the way that it should. When you don't get that sound, your brain is essentially in a state of auditory deprivation. And when that happens, the auditory cortex in your brain, that area gets overtaken by other sensory areas like the sense of touch, the sense of smell, the sense of uh, you know, uh, vision, things like that will start to overtake that auditory cortex area and your ability to process information and to stimulate your brain in the same way you would if you got that sound changes. <coughs> All right, myth number four, hearing aids cost over $3,000 a piece. Uh, while this isn't necessarily incorrect, when you go to a hearing aid clinic, a lot of them will sell hearing aids that have the price tag of $3,000 or more or maybe even less. The important thing to understand is that it isn't the hearing aid itself that is costing that much money. What typical clinics do is that they bundle in the cost of their care the, for the testing, the fitting, the programming, the aftercare of cleaning and maintenance and warranty, all of that is bundled inside of the cost of the hearing aid. So when you go and you're like, well, how does this little tiny device, this little medical device cost that much money? The reason is, is because they are uh, bundling the cost of all of those services in with the hearing aid. This raises, uh, a concern uh, in our industry and, and what has really kind of happened is that we've got into this mindset that uh, to treat hearing loss and to treat it well you need the most expensive hearing aid and that is not the case. The case is, is that you need a hearing aid that's right for you and you need the aftercare that is right for you. When clinics bundle the cost of everything together to where you can't really see what the co true cost of the hearing aid is and you can't see what the true cost of their service is, it, it, there's a disconnect. You don't really understand what you're paying for and what you should be getting. And by doing that, they've programmed us to believe that the hearing device costs this really high amount and that the service has no component in that. It works really great for clinics who don't give you the proper amount of care after they sell you the hearing aid. And it works great for those uh, clinics that give you uh, more essentially than what you pay for from that standpoint. But it's important that we all understand that when you're going in and buying hearing aids, there is always a component of aftercare and service that goes along with that. And I would say that the, the number one most important factor when considering where to go to receive your hearing treatment is are they going to be following the best, practice, best practices of the hearing care industry and are they going to be doing it with extreme precision? And if they do those things, then you found a good place. 
All right, myth number five, tinnitus or that ringing and buzzing that we uh, can hear in our ears is never serious. Um, there is an article actually written in 85086 magazine uh, this, this month where I talked about uh, tinnitus and what its impact is and what the causes are. And for the most part, tinnitus is likely caused by a decline in your hearing. When you have a decline in your hearing, your brain is searching for that sound that it knows should be there, and so it creates this phantom sound to replace it. And that's what we experience is this ringing and buzzing sound. There are a few cases, though, where if you get unilateral, meaning one ear or the other, if you get tinnitus on one side only, there is a chance that it's a tumor on your auditory nerve that's causing that. And you essentially need to get that checked as soon as possible. So what you wanna do is you wanna get your hearing test evaluated. If they see the imbalance there, they're gonna send you to a, a ear, nose and throat doctor or otologist and they will order an MRI to do an image of your, your brain stem and of your auditory nerve and to see if there's an actual tumor growing on it. So uh, a lot of people, they just discount, oh, it's, you know, it's just this ringing sound, I've gotten used to it or whatnot. It's something that you should have checked out. Um, and there is 60% of individuals, when it's not a tumor, get relief from hearing aids because you're feeding the brain that sound again. So it, does, it tells your brain basically you can shut off that mechanism of creating the tinnitus. All right, myth number six. The newest hearing aid will always help you hear better. This kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Yes, you do need a good hearing aid. The best hearing aid will perform better than the, the lowest level of hearing aid, but only if it's fit well. If a hearing aid is not fit well, you experience things like discomfort, that whistling sound, uh, no perceived benefit uh, with having it in versus having it off, or very minimal benefit. If you have a hearing aid fit correctly, and you are in fact a candidate for hearing aids, that hearing aid will help you perform better from a communication standpoint and possibly a tinnitus relief standpoint. On top of that though, there are certain individuals that have hearing losses that are so bad where there's so much damage inside their inner ear that senses that sound that a hearing aid is no longer an option for them. When that happens, they move into the realm of cochlear implant candidacy. So if someone has uh, really bad speech understanding scores, the way that we determine this is that we fit them properly with the hearing aid that's right for them, and then we take them through testing. If they are unable to repeat sentences back at 40% accuracy or better, then they are technically a candidate for a cochlear implant. And so what that entails basically is it's saying that you would likely receive more benefit from an electrode that's inserted into your inner ear organ or your cochlea stimulating that nerve directly and getting that sound to your brain, right? Because we, again, hear with our brains, not with our ears. And uh, so you wouldn't necessarily be a cochlear implant candidate, or sorry, that would make you a cochlear implant candidate. The thing is, is that there are a lot of individuals that are out there who are wearing hearing aids thinking that that is the best treatment option for them, and that is not the case. If you do not perform well with hearing aids uh, at that measured level, you are a candidate for cochlear implant. And if you, act, if you want to go through that process, which people think is incredibly invasive, you'd be in the hospital for uh, you know, weeks at a time, it's basically in and out, same day type of surgery. And so um, it, it's very important to understand that there are options for you if hearing aids aren't meeting your needs. There is a step beyond that to give you more clarity to speech. All right, so um, my clinic here in Anthem is uh, just south of the outlets, all right? I opened up in this area because there is no access to hearing healthcare here at this time. And uh, being on the outskirts of Phoenix, I mean, once you go down into Phoenix, I mean, there's on every street corner, it seems like there's a hearing aid dealer or dispenser. And I wanted to make sure I went into a place that actually needed my services, not that was already oversaturated. And I think it's important, accessibility is a really important aspect of not just hearing care, but uh, health care in general. And so, it's really one of those things where it's, it's important that we have the availability, availability of high quality care no matter where we're at. 
And Anthem, uh, being a growing city, we just had a couple new retirement communities open up. We have parents that are there. Uh, there's grandparents that are there, of course. Um, and being able to provide uh, these services to them is, is really important for their continued health and well-being. Um, that being said, um, that's the end of what I really wanted to, to get out from the myth standpoint. I did want to save some time though uh, for questions and I know there's a few of us here uh, if we if we don't have questions that's fine I have a couple other things I can go into um, but are there any questions in general right now about hearing loss and hearing treatment? Yes sir. Why is it sometimes you have squeal and sometimes light squeal and sometimes a big squeal which is often that if you're wearing a hearing it would be really high. Are we talking about tinnitus or a hearing aid itself? Uh, the, tinnitus. the tinnitus. Yep, so there can be fluctuations in tinnitus. Um, you, you know, that connection from your ear up to your brain, uh, it's a nerve that can have spontaneous reactions as well, and so it can uh, essentially fluctuate from that standpoint. There's another uh, issue with tinnitus, though, is that if you have, if your ears are plugged up with earwax, and there's a, a fluctuating, like a, sometimes there's a break in the seal of the earwax and sound can get through, but if it's blocked off completely, you typically notice your tinnitus even more from that standpoint. So, um, you know, it, we could do it now. If anyone in here has tinnitus, if you plug your ear, likely you will perceive that tinnitus as being even louder. And this is why, you know, even if you go into a quiet room is probably where you notice it the most. And I don't know if any, but you sounds like you have tinnitus. If you go into a quiet room, you might notice your tinnitus more than if you're in an area where there's more sound to, to, to where it's masking over that tinnitus. And so from a, from a standpoint of addressing tinnitus specifically, there are several things that you can do. Hearing aids are not the only treatment option for tinnitus. You can use other things like noise generators in your home. There's an app on uh, smartphones called Starkey Sound Relax that you can use to uh, mask over that tinnitus with pleasant sounds like running uh, or babbling brook or uh, wind chimes, things like that, that you can kind of set to where you were hearing your tinnitus to mask over it so it doesn't cause you annoyance anymore. Right. Yep. So uh, what you're referring to is the the over-the-counter drops uh, for tinnitus that you can squeeze into your ears. Right. So um, those have not been clinically proven to work in, in any in any form. Uh, you might perceive some kind of change because you are putting something into your ear. It's coating your eardrum with like an oil type solution uh, to where it can make you perceive things differently. Um, but from a long-term standpoint of, of treating tinnitus, it's not, it's not an FDA even approved treatment for that. Um, there are, it'd be nice if it was, I mean, that'd be a, a super simple, easy fix. And, and I have tinnitus in my right ear from my hearing loss, but um, uh, none of that stuff has been proven uh, short-term or long-term really uh, to be effective. I think the best bet from that standpoint is identifying uh, if, getting a hearing test, identifying where the tinnitus is being caused at by your, you know, from that loss in your ear, and then treating that cause specifically, which, which is what will give you relief. Okay. Yep. Assuming you have some degree of hearing loss, will using a hearing aid alter the progression of your hearing loss? Stop it? Accelerate it? Or how does it compare to continuing to ignore the problem? Yep, good question. So uh, the question, just to kind of rephrase it, will wearing a hearing aid halt the progression of a decline in hearing or, or accelerate it or something like that even, right? So the answer to that question is, is that no, it won't have an impact on the decline of your hearing from a measurable standpoint. Uh, if, if you're somewhat familiar with hearing tests, they play you beeps and they wanna see how softly you can hear the beeps. It won't adjust or it won't affect uh, that decline or that slope in your hearing, 
But what you run the risk of potentially is, and this is why we always encourage people to treat their hearing loss sooner, is that when your brain is in a state of auditory deprivation, we don't know what its capabilities are gonna be after we try to pull it out of that state of deprivation. So let's, let's go into a hypothetical here. Come in when you're 50 years old, yeah, I'm, I'm experiencing some hearing difficulty, my hearing loss is you know, moderate, moderate severe maybe, um, but I'm not perceiving enough difficulty to wanna to do anything with it now. Uh, if I get a hearing aid, it's not really gonna stop it from declining, it's not going to you know, make it worse, so I don't really see the importance of doing something right now. But then when you come back in at age 60, and your ability to understand speech, even when you're getting that sound to your brain, if that declined from 100% speech understanding to 60%, was that caused by the lack of stimulation to your brain? And so when we're measuring hearing loss, we, we're measuring it at the ear level. We're measuring how much damage essentially was done to the inner ear called the cochlea. And, uh, that cochlea will continue to have either that level of hearing loss or continue to decline, but wearing a hearing aid won't get that cochlea to perform any better once you take those hearing aids out. Okay, so um, from an urgency standpoint, it, it makes a lot of sense, uh, cognitive decline aside, right? We don't know 100% if wearing a hearing aid is going to prevent cognitive decline, but from the standpoint of we know we've, we've, there's been research done that when you wear a hearing aid and you've had hearing loss, your brain changes. It changes and it, and it reincorporates the auditory cortex and it prevents other sensory areas of your brain from infiltrating the auditory cortex. And, and what this does is it prevents you from having to strain so hard to hear um, and it makes it, more, uh, makes it easier to hear. So from the standpoint of, I mean, you really want to be treating your hearing loss early. If you do treat it early, it's not going to prevent your ear level mechanism from working properly, but potentially down the road, it could prevent your brain from working correctly. How often would you need to, for lack of a better term, upgrade your hearing aid? Is it you buy it once, it's set, every two years, it's like a tune-up? Right. What's the time progression? Yeah, so the time progression of when you want to upgrade your hearing aids is, <laughs> I hate to say it like this, it's different for everybody. Um, this is what I will say. A hearing aid will physically last you if you take good care of it and you get proper maintenance and follow-up care with it. It can last you seven plus years. The typical trend of what people are replacing their hearing aids is about every 4.4 years. And the factors that go into this is, is twofold. One is the technology improving vastly enough to make sense to upgrade into certain features that you find beneficial. And I'll give you an example. Um, in 2003, two, or sorry, 2013, 2014, uh, companies were really making a push to make their hearing aids compatible directly with an iPhone to where you could stream phone calls into both ears, which is great because we all hear better when two ears participate in a task. Um, it allowed you to do things like remote control functions from that iPhone. Uh, you could do a lost and found feature. If you ever lost your hearing aids, you could track them down. Um, that made a lot of sense to a lot of people who struggled with those certain things of uh, making adjustments, hearing on the phone. But if you're the type of person where, well, those were really your needs anyway, then it probably made more sense to you of staying with whatever original technology you had as long as it was functioning properly. That being said, for, so that's the first aspect. The second aspect really is how well are you taking care of it and how well was it fit to you, okay? So a lot of clinic, I, I know firsthand, I know a lot of audiologists who, who run clinics this way and in three years, they come back and like, you know, uh, the, patient, the patient will come in and say, you know, I'm just not hearing as well as I feel like I should be hearing with this hearing. And they're like, okay, well, let's get you into a new hearing aid, send you home with it, see how you perform with it. Um, and, and they do that and then they come back and like, oh, I think it's, I'm hearing a little bit better. Okay, great. Well, that's another you know, six, $7,000 for you to spend on that. Whereas if they would have taken the time to make sure that that hearing aid was programmed appropriately, and that over the course of that three years, it was maintained appropriately, the chances of you s perceiving substantial benefit from, uh, without having like major you know, innovation, right? With like iPhone technology, things like that. That hearing aid, that, that three years newer hearing aid 
wouldn't likely have that much more of an impact on how well you would hear. Uh, it just it's by chance that maybe that new hearing that they got in, that they uh, initially fit to you, not using best practices of programming and things like that, um, that hearing aid may have made you perceive a little bit better. Uh, but from the age standpoint, if it makes sense to, for you to switch every three years because there's a new feature set that, that allows you to do things substantially better than what you did before, then it makes a sense to do it every three years. Um, but a really well fit seven year old hearing aid will perform way better than a poorly fit one year old hearing aid. So it really comes down to how well is that hearing aid fit and are you consistently going in to get these adjustments made as your hearing fluctuates, changes a little bit, and, and requires maintenance over time. Yep. Why is the fit so important? The fit from a physical fit standpoint? Yeah. Yep. So physical fit is incredibly important and is something that often goes ignored. In order to program a hearing aid correctly, the fit needs to be right, the physical fit inside of your ears. Uh, there are certain functional things about how a hearing aid is in your ears, both in terms of depth inside your ear canal and in terms of venting. And for instance, let me give you an example here again. If you have a hearing aid that has a big wide open vent on it that allows the passage of you know, some natural sound and air, things like that into your ear and uh, to make contact with your eardrum, but you have a low frequency hearing loss, no matter how good I am at programming, I can't program that hearing aid in order to give you benefit if all of that sound is leaking right out of that vent hole, okay? Now, if you had a type of hearing loss that is only high frequency, we can put a big vent hole on there and the high frequencies will stay in your ear, the low frequencies will, will come in naturally and I can treat your hearing loss. But if you come in, it, the thing is is that all of the fit parameters you have to get right first before you go into the programming. If you don't get the fit right, it doesn't matter what best practices I follow, how much attention to detail you, I put into the programming, I can't get the hearing aid to do what I want it to do. And then lastly, on top of that, if it physically does not feel well, you're not gonna wear it and it, it wouldn't serve any purpose at that point either. Any other questions? You can think of right now. Real specific yep. one, by chance. Yep. Are you a member of the Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield group of providers? Um, I, as of November 1st, will be part of Blue Cross Blue Shield, which will give me access to that insurance. Yes. Okay. Good question. Yes. Can you just give examples of um, high frequency, low frequency? Because um, sometimes I get confused with that, and then when you're talking about like severe hearing loss and like, um, like a lower hearing loss, mm -hmm. is that a is a low hear a low hearing loss associated with like a high frequency or are those okay. association or how does yeah? That let me kind of let me kind of section it out here. So um, the first part of the question for you uh, was talking about the, what things you're missing based on the type of hearing loss, right? So, uh, I think it might be actually easier for me to answer the second part of the question, which is uh, like low, middle and high frequency and severity and things like that. So, um, the most typical type of hearing loss, uh, is age related hearing loss, which is typically you get to retain your low pitch ranges, which is like the deep like man voice sounds, right? You get that good volume from low frequency sounds uh, when you're playing the bass or things like that. And then it starts to slope down in the mids to high frequencies. High frequencies are what give you clarity to speech. And so if we really separate those out, low frequency, high frequency, what's, what's really causing that perceptual difference of lack of clarity or lack of volume? Well, low frequency encompasses the vowel sounds of what we have in our alphabet. High frequency encompasses the consonant sounds. So vowels give you volume, consonants give you clarity. And so this goes back to that question of, well, I feel like I can hear, you know, I hear Phil talking, I just can't hear what he's saying because he's mumbling. Well, it's not that Phil is mumbling, it's that you don't have the high frequency speech components coming from his mouth into your ear and making it to your brain, okay? Um, and then in terms of severity, you can have different severity levels. So if you have a high frequency hearing loss, 
you can have either a mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe or profound hearing loss in those frequency ranges while still having completely normal hearing in the low frequencies, right? So, um, and then another thing on top of that is perceptually, when you have really good low frequency hearing and really bad high frequency hearing, and you go into a noisy environment, noise tends to be low frequency in nature. So you're hearing all this wonderful background noise, but you can't hear the person sitting across from you trying to talk to you because all the high frequency components that lets you separate out background noise from speech, you don't have access to anymore. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Um, well, if there's no other questions, guys, I, I hope you had whatever questions that you had regarding this, the, the hearing healthcare uh, in this state that we're currently in, where the rate of occurrence of hearing loss is exceeding the rate of treatment that te technically puts us at epidemic type levels of hearing loss. But the good news is, is that regardless of the type of hearing loss that you have, there are treatment options for it. I would urge you to um, at least know, have a hearing test, get checked, at least know where you're at so you can make a decision of whether it's logical for you at this point to actually do something about it or if it's something that you're not ready to commit to, at least you have a foundation of where you are right now. Um, and, and, and don't let hearing loss kind of get swept under the rug anymore. So thank you guys. I really appreciate your time uh, coming here in the middle of the day uh, on a weekday. I know it's tough. The next one I do of these, I'll put it on the weekend so it'll be easier. Thanks guys. <laughs>